Welcome to the Protectors Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Piccolo. I'd like to welcome Mark Valley to the show. How you doing, Mark? Great, great. Thanks, Jason, for having me. You have an incredible background. You've been in acting for uh, for decades now, but you also started out in the military. And then it uh, looks like you grew up up north, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I grew up in upstate New York on the Canadian border. How was that? It was cold. <laughs> yeah, I grew up like I didn't play hockey, but I was a hockey fan. So, you know, I used to go watch hockey games in Montreal. So it was a, it was a strange situation growing up on a border because, on one hand, it's a very American city, but you're right on the edge of the country, looking at another country as well. So um, I like to think I had kind of an international experience up there. <laughs> Definitely an international nexus, that's for sure. Now, did you stay there your whole life or did you move out? Uh, did you join the military right after? Oh, you went to West Point. That's right. Yeah, I went to West Point. So I, it's funny. Some people think West Point is like this school you go to when you're 12. <laughs> you know, that you're one of these kids that you, you got sent to uh, military school for bad behavior or something. But no, it was, uh, you know, it's a competitive, obviously a, pretty, a very competitive college and I got into it. And uh, that was in 1983, served four years. That was around the time. I mean, it was probably 10 years after Vietnam had ended. You know, there were still Vietnam veterans roaming around and nobody was really talking about it much. It just that there wasn't, the military wasn't a big draw. (laughs) It wasn't a a popular option at the time. But, you know, I had a strong sense of service as a kid as well. Plus seeing some of these Vietnam guys come back, I, I, I felt I had to serve as well. So, yeah, so I went in and then after that, I served for five years and then I got out and became an actor. Really cool. Now, uh, what branch did you go into? Engineer. I wish I was going to go infantry and seriously gung ho. And then at the last minute, I thought, oh, no, wait a second. One of the things I really like doing is problem solving. And uh, I was a math major in school. So I thought, you know, as an engineer, I might be able to use that skill a little more. So that's what I did. Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. I was uh, enlisted artillery, then I branched uh, infantry. I was like, what am I thinking? <laughs> you know, so, and then uh, my wife was an MI officer later on, too. So it was kind of kind of interesting. Oh, were there things I, she couldn't tell you? Yeah, I know. Just <laughs> you know, military intelligence is an oxymoron in the military. We know that one, but it's yeah. Just, yeah. It's a different world. So uh, did you deploy? I was, well, I, we didn't really call it that. It was the Gulf War, and yeah, it was it was a strange time. We thought it was going to be a much larger larger war, obviously, than it, than it turned out to be. I was in Germany at the time, and I think that what they needed or what they were planning for were replacement soldiers once the hostilities had begun. So they went to USER, the U.S. Army Europe units, and said, "We need you know so many from each company and." I was put in charge of a detachment of, you know, more or less disposable soldiers from from across Europe. I mean, you can imagine if you're in a company and they say, listen, we need you to send three guys to the Gulf War. We don't know if you're going to deploy or not, but we need you to send these other three guys on their own to, to do something. We're not really sure what it is. We weren't getting the best and the brightest. So it was me and like the dirty four dozen who you know, were sent over to... Saudi Arabia. It was bizarre. The air campaign had already begun. We had no idea how devastating it was going to be. But we were stationed in Kobar barracks. And when I got there, yeah. I kept asking people, what's going on? What are we doing? And, you know, soldiers like we're living in these strange hotels, this strange sort of condominiums. You know, we're just sort of shacking up in there. <laughs> I mean, it's the same place that was blown up by I think, yeah. about six years later. But they said, no, we're, um, you're actually waiting. <laughs> I said, waiting for what? <laughs> and it was a little, it was a little macabre, you know? Oh, no. But they thought, well, well, we'll give you guys something to do. It just so happened that the tra- they had a transportation problem. Once the Scud missiles started falling along the pipeline road, a lot of the civilian truckers just said, to heck with it. They were mostly Sri Lankans anyway. They said, we're done. So we needed to do our own, move our own goods. And what they were doing was transporting enough goods, you know, material and equipment for us 
about six months of sustained conventional war against the Iraqi army. So I was in a trans. We, I was in a transportation. You know, I just became a convoy leader. We just brought <laughs> from, you know, five hundred pound bombs to water bottles. It was kind of interesting. Yeah, definitely. Uh, but later on in the war effort, I, I went over to uh, in 05, 06, and I was in Kuwait for a couple months before I pushed north. And it turned into all civilians pushing so much of the goods up north from mm-hmm. Kuwait and Iraq. And it's just these massive third country national convoys guarded by uh, a few U.S. troops. Uh, what a situation. So now you're, you're back. You're, you're done with the Army. Was acting always in your blood? No, it wasn't. Uh, I've told the story a couple of times. I mean, as a kid, I could do impersonations. That was just sort of, I don't know. I always thought that was some sort of skill that humans had for hunting, you know, being able to imitate birds or animal sounds or something. But no, I was imitating humans and I thought that was kind of fun. But never, I just never really had the the real force of performing. Like I wasn't a kid that wanted to do theater or anything like that. So, um, but when I got into the army, the the impersonation thing became became kind of a draw. People thought, "Oh, can you can you uh, uh, you know impersonate Colonel Slauson at his at his hail and farewell or something?" So yeah, so I would impersonate the officers and I would write little sketches and um, that was that was fun. But it was more or less a, a hobby, like a side hobby that I would do. And but it it was a it was a good it was a good audience. I remember getting you know trying to a room full of officers in their you know dress uniforms. I mean, getting them to kind of laugh at some you know raunchy stuff was always kind of fun. But I didn't really think that was a reality until I think it was after I, I was in I was stationed in Berlin. I was there before the wall came down. I got to live in a big city and see all that. And then I went to the Gulf War. Um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't in, in any uh, combat, but then I came back. I wasn't in combat, but it was a weird situation where like Scud missiles were landing nearby and people were dying that I knew. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think some of the guys that signed up after 9-11 had a little more of an idea of what was going on. Um, but for us at the time, we thought, wait a second, this is... Wait, did we did we go to war? Wasn't it a war? I think I always think that film. God, what was that film with um, George Clooney and Mark? Oh Wahlberg? yeah, Three Kings. <laughs> Three Kings. There's that one line where Mark Wahlberg is like standing on this berm and he looks over and he goes yells to him across this kind of desert. That I mean, you know it. It just kind of like yeah. sucks the sound out of everything, right? He just yells, "Are we shooting, guys?" Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's sort of what it felt. I mean, growing up listening to Vietnam veterans and you know watching those. Oh my gosh! I know. When you're in the shit, you know. Yeah, it's like you watch Platoon and you're like, "Oh man, I'm going to war." Strange, like that. <laughs> a little surreal. But anyway, that, that experience happened, and then I came back and. Um, I think before that, the Berlin Wall came down. So I was there when the wall came down, and I saw that happening. And uh, those are life-changing events where you see something that is so entrenched, is so a heavy part of history, and your your belief system just disappear literally overnight. Uh, it, it made me, it, it kind of opened my mind a little bit, and I thought, you know, um, why don't I, if, if I only have one life to live, you know, <laughs> why don't I do whatever I want? Or at least give that a try. So um, that's what I did. So I, I, uh, yeah, I started looking around for acting schools, and I was an extra on a movie first, and saw the circus, and thought, "Wow, this is cool." So I'd really like to. I'm not really sure what this is. I could probably be an actor. That seems to be something I'm pretty good at. That was the easiest way in, and um, took some classes and started working, and yeah, here I am. So was your big breakout in soaps? Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a job on Days of Our Lives and I played the dashing Jack Devereaux for three years. I got to go back and check that out. My wife and I used to watch Days back in the 90s. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I was Jack. Well, middle Jack. There was a guy, that, uh, there was maybe three of us that played Jack. I know, that's what I got to find, which one you were. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, now we talked a little bit right before the show about Keen Eddie. And that's to me that that seems like one of your, you know, I think that's your breakout role as far as getting into a, uh, like dramedy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that was fun. 
that was uh, I was the only American actor and like a whole like a crew of English actors. And you know, being in that environment where you know they're not as precious about acting over there. It's much more of like a it's like a, a skill and a craft and a working class sort of thing. There is it isn't. There's nothing magic or special or or even really celebrity about it over there, which was a great experience for me for a year. Now you've had a ton of great roles, uh, Human Target. Um, what do you call it? Um, what was the other big one I wanted to talk to you about? Where you played an FBI agent? Uh, Fringe. Yeah, that's what it was. Fringe. And uh, lately, you've been, you've been doing some local work called Zberg, right? Yeah, I made a, a web series called Zberg, and I wanted to do a web series. I wanted to start. I, I'd already directed some episodes of a, of, of a friend's ep- a web series, The Millionaires, and thought, okay, I want to start. I, I want to do something amateur. I don't want to sort of jump into these big, big productions. Not that I was being offered that, but I thought I want to be able to make some mistakes and I wanted to do a web series and I thought, well, why do it in Los Angeles? There seems, seems to be saturated with it. Um, so why not, uh, why not do it in my hometown and just try to show some, uh, you know, local flavor, local communities, as opposed to, you know, two guys that work at a pizza shop in a major metropolitan area or something. So I, uh, went to my hometown and talked to some people. I'd written a short story about an experience I had as a kid when I threw a snowball at the wrong car. And that was the starting point. And I, uh, yeah, I got some people together and put a production and now it's at zbergny.com. And it was a wonderful opportunity to involve an entire community, not only actors and talent and, um, some people that are sort of always wanted to do it, but never really had the opportunity, but also, you know, business people and, um, you know, government and police, fire and rescue, everybody helped out. That's really cool. Did you happen to employ any vets in that? Um, I, <laughs> that's a good <laughs> question. That's a good question. I was thinking about, the, you know, that's a bigger question to, to, to get into is I, I, let me think. Yes, I did. Well, uh, my, a good friend of mine up there, he's a veteran as well. And, um, he was, he's been more or less been there since, since day one. He plays one of the, one of the police. He's done everything from, you know, transportation, pick me up at the airport. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll even come up with ideas on this, on the set. He played one of the police. He's a very funny guy, Chip Gracie. So yeah, he was, uh, he's, he's one of the veterans. Oh, very cool. Now, the other big thing I wanted to talk to you today was like, you're very into, um, uh, volunteer work and you, you did a short for Maisha meds. Can you explain, talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Every once in a while I like to take myself completely out of context of what I'm doing. I've done it before. And I think Sri Lanka for a little while and then in the Dominican Republic, I worked for about a, uh, like a, a month for the Clinton foundation. And I, there's, you know, some skills I learned when I was in, in school that along the, along the topics of along the, supply chain stuff basically is what it is. So um, I thought, well, maybe I could do like a work volunteer thing again. I sort of felt the urge. And I've, I'd been to Africa before, once before, and I thought, well, I'd love to go to Kenya this time. So I went to Kenya and started working for a medical startup. It's called the Social um, Enterprises. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a company that does, it's using technology to solve some you know, some real world problems in the medical industry in rural Kenya and, and in the cities, but um, also it's, it's sustainable. So it's not just an NGO or a charity where you're sending money and they're spending it. It's they're, you know, setting up a viable business model that can continue on, on its own. I thought, what a great idea. Um, you know, I know someone that had been looking around for, for jobs like that for me. So I got there and I was just going to, you know, help them maybe take pictures and help them, you know, maybe do some, forecasting stuff or kind of look at their, look at the clinics or look at the pharmacies, but it's just, everybody's just so smart nowadays. <laughs> everybody had it all, everybody seemed to have it all figured out, especially these kids from, you know, these, these young programmers. And uh, so I thought, well, um, maybe I could help them tell their story a little bit. So I interviewed everybody for kind of in a podcast fashion for them to use on their website. And I thought, you know, what'd be kind of cool is to put together like a short narrative film where I could tell their story, not necessarily a talking head documentary, but, um, 
maybe like a, a quick visual narrative of a you know a woman in a rural Kenya trying to get medications for a sick child and everything that this company is doing to try to make that possible. And yeah, I trimmed it down to about two minutes, 30 seconds. I slapped on some narration by yours truly. And uh, yeah, I've got a nice little product to pay for my summer vacation. So now I'm definitely going to uh, link that to the podcast as well. Cause that, that, you know, that little short, it touches on a whole bunch of things you don't even think about. Like the counterfeit meds coming across, people think they're getting the right meds and all of a sudden, Hey, you know what? Um, they're not. <laughs> and, it's a real problem. And it's hard to, it's hard to control it as well because it's just so huge. It is. And then, you know, you always think, well, if you, if you're going to spend a lot of money, you're going to give it over here then people are just going to get meds. But over there, they actually have to have health insurance. They actually have to do the same types of things that we do. And when someone's making maybe $2 a month or $2 a day, they really can't afford those you know, $30 medications. So if you do have these awesome organizations like my Meds, they could actually give the meds so people aren't dying. I mean, it's simple, but that's, that's the simple factor about it. Yeah, and the interesting thing about Kenya now is that, uh, I mean, they're, you know, like any, like a lot of governments, they, you know, they have some corruption issues, but they're really genuinely trying to get the bureaucracy out of the way to try and involve some new technologies to solve some problems. So you're seeing this real leap ahead in Africa. I mean, since, you know, generally the early 60s, there was, um, or, well, almost all the countries in Africa gained their independence and there was, um, you know, all this colonial residue left over and this system that they, um, you know, could or couldn't, you know, in some instances could or couldn't sustain, um, you know, nowadays it's like, okay, we've got some problems. You have some solutions, uh, come on over, partner up with some, um, with some Kenyans and let's see what we can do. So you're seeing all these innovations in, um, you know, agriculture, uh, energy, water, power. Um, there's a lot of startups over there that are just sort of, you know, they're not having to deal with a lot of the partisan politics that we have right here. Um, and they're able to kind of implement some, some broad, uh, some broad technological solutions. So they make it happen. <laughs> yeah. They say, I mean, exactly. we, we shot with, with essentially their surgeon general, like I don't really know what, what, what the equivalent would be, but his, it was their, you know, director of pharmacies and poisons. And they said, yeah, we love the idea of doing a quick movie. Come on in. Can we shoot? in your building. Yeah. Shoot us too. We want to be in it. <laughs> so, uh, that was a pretty fun experience. Yeah, I can imagine it's, it just happens. It's great. I wish we can get some stuff like that happening over here, but, uh, that's another story for another day. Yeah. Now, um, you mentioned something, you know, getting back from the war, then all of a sudden you're like, Hey, you know what? I want to do something different. I want to do something yeah. I've always wanted to do, which not always wanted to do, but something, you know, just completely different. A lot of veterans I've talked to want to get into the acting field. Do you have advice for them? Yes. Uh, y- you know, yeah. Question your motives. That's my first, that's my first thing is I remember thinking at, at the time when I was getting out, cause I still had, I've had this, yeah, I have this kind of granted, I, you know, I like I like to take vacations and, you know, enjoy myself and, eat hamburgers and drink beers, but you know, I've got a sense of, of service as well. And I remember hearing Robert Kennedy say something about, you know, there, there are many other ways to serve, serve your country um, or to serve people or to serve your community or your family or, and uh, besides being in the military, besides being, you know, one of the warriors or fighters or the support. So um, I kind of took that to heart. One of the things that sort of sustained me was I, I, I always felt that I was helping tell stories or I was helping people um, feel things who couldn't necessarily feel things when I started out. And I, and I kept that uh, general purpose. I mean, if my purpose was just to make, become and make it as an actor or just get work as an actor, that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit hard to sustain because I think people in some ways might be able to see through that. And, uh, or maybe you don't really know what you're, what you're, what you're after. But that was my thing was to kind of ground it in some sort of, in some sort of service related purpose. And that sustained me through my transition because, uh, you know, you get lonely, you think, wait, this is so much different than being in the military. There's so many more uh, options and different rules and different, uh, what's the chain of command in this business? I don't know what's going on. What do I have to do? So, um, 
that was important for me to maintain a, 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 f- a feeling of purpose or a, kind of a defined purpose. Other things I would say is I would look into um, acting as a craft, but it's only one piece of the pie of, of storytelling or of communicating something to people. And I would, wor- I would stress that you, know, you have to take acting classes. And that was one of the things I uh, brought with me from the military was, well, if I'm going to be an actor, I have to go. You can't just be an airborne ranger, right? You got to go to school for that. And I thought, well, I, am I going to be an actor? I've got to go to school for that as well. So I, I'd recommend you know, taking classes and, and working on your craft, but also keeping in mind the bigger picture is, uh, you know, your, your storytellers and start learning some other aspects of craft because I think right now, um, there's a, it's just a time where everything is so easy to learn and so available that you can make your own, you can make your own content and you can make your own good content. And it doesn't necessarily have to be content that is made just to get you a bigger, another job or just to get you a bigger job. You could make something that you really believe in. And, um, that's, that's sort of what I feel. That's really great advice. I mean, that's a lot of things I've been picking up is you actually, it, you got it. Another thing is you have to kind of treat it as a job and in a way you have to prepare for it. You can't just say, Hey, you know what, when I'm going to go stand a bunch in front of people, bunch, stand in bunch, stand in front of a bunch of people. That's what I'm trying to say. And, yeah. uh, just talk, you know, you actually have to know what you're doing. And I would, and I would suggest that people and especially military who want to be an actor is, you know, to get to know the business a little bit more. Um, because acting is acting is it's the entry position, not the entry level position. I mean, it's a real, it's a, it's an amazing skill and you can be really well rewarded for it, but it is the most, um, familiar of the jobs when you're looking at the entertainment industry from the outside, you know, it's like, wait, I can be the guy who's standing, leaning against a car, waiting for a girl to come out of the cafe. (laughs) I can be the guy who's on the SWAT team. You, You look at it like, Oh, I can do that job of the person who's performing or doing something because military is very much a, a performative environment. You know, you're not, uh, so I, I, I'd kind of look at it and then question your, what you really want to do in that business because um, I mean, the writer's guild has this wonderful veterans writing, writing project for the writer's guild foundation. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, you know, there's all sorts of organizations that are helping veterans get into other areas of the business and, you know, getting into, and maybe join your crew. Maybe what you really like is operating a camera. Maybe what you really like is, is directing or, um, or even producing. And there's a lot of, a lot of veterans who just kind of easily trans transitioned into producing like Brian Chung. He's somebody you should probably have on here. So I, I'd kind of, I'd look at it like that. Just kind of question, wait, do I just want to, I want to tell stories or, you know, am I one of those guys that has to like tap dance on a stage and do something? <laughs> you know, not to denigrate acting, but you know, op- open your mind a little bit. You know, take, yeah, take, a, take a good look at it. And network—that's a huge thing too. Is make sure you know because you might want to be the guy. You <laughs> might not know exactly what you want to do, but you know, mm-hmm. talking to other people definitely. You could Who told you that networking. Uh, Jennifer and I were talking about that. Uh-huh. That's worked. Phone. That's worked for her. Yeah, networking out with other vets. Uh, mm-hmm talking to different people, finding out what your niche is. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to get a lot of information really quickly. That's one thing I miss about the military is you instantly you're with a hundred people who, you know, a hundred different eyes and ears of or hundreds who, you know, are listening to different things, seeing different things. Yeah. That's what I'm finding out about the podcast world is you're meeting a lot of different people in a short amount of time uh, and having interesting conversations and learning more. And that's mm-hmm. the greatest thing about these things. And why'd you get into it? Uh, that's basically it. You know, I, I had a, a very, um, I was doing a lot of political stuff, uh, a lot of news, uh, Fox News, uh, all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I wanted to have a show that just kind of talked to, was non-political. I could talk to vets, mm-hmm. LEOs, firemen, and just kind of get inspirational stories and kind of see what their backgrounds are and kind of see how we could all help each other out. That's kind of the, the whole uh, inspiration for this podcast. Cool. What else can I do? <laughs> what else can you do? Well, for now, uh, you know, sit here and keep answering questions. That's <laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, you're doing it, you know, cause that's the thing is people will listen to your, your story and they'd be like, Hey, you know what? I never thought about doing that. Maybe I can do it. 
and uh, get inspired, you know, not just acting, but to volunteer, to, uh, to even just like your short, you have a, a career set and you use it to help other people. And that's kind of the, one of the inspirations for getting in touch with you for the podcast. Oh, cool. Yeah. I'm glad you could appreciate that. I mean, a lot of times they look at, I remember this for, people will always question like why you do things like, why are you doing this podcast? Are you trying to get a job as a, as a, to play a spy in a show or like I have my own podcast, the life drop, which is about intelligence and diplomacy. And you know, you're always going to have that, that, that uh, strange suspicion, you know, are you, why are you doing this? Are you doing this to help? How are you going to help yourself? But the truth is like every time I do a volunteer activity or something like that, I, you know, it also helps me as well. I, I, you know, I get out of the house, I, you know, engage with people. I don't like to just be sort of wrapped up in the, um, the business world or the social world of, of Hollywood. I always try to get out and get, get my, human experience from real primary sources <laughs> and uh and those 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 uh, volunteer things give me opportunity for that yeah and that's kind of like i i love the idea of podcasting you know just being able to have just normal conversations with people with not having an ulterior motive that's kind of a really cool idea about this too yeah what have you learned so far i've learned a ton man uh Leadership lessons from Jason Redman the other day, mm -hmm. kind of talking, learning about how Hollywood works with uh, Jennifer Marshall, Matthew Broderick. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to check out my interview with Jason Schechterly um, and Benjamin Breckheimer, both of these guys injured in a line of duty um, and just driving on. You know, none, nobody ever talked to uh, that's been injured, shot uh, in a fire, anything blown up by an IED has let any of that stop them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm learning, learning every time, you know, I'm, what have you learned about, about interviewing or, or I mean, even, a, even, a you know, the, the, the social craft of having a conversation. I'm trying to get rid of all my ums, <laughs> but other than that, I'm trying to just, I, I don't like to do a lot of, a lot of research. I mean, I've been following you for a while just cause, um, your background and your, your work. Yeah. I like to learn as I go. I feel right. if I, if I do too much research, I'll be trying to answer the questions because, you know, I came from an, I have an LEO background. So I'm a lot, I do a lot of uh, interview and interrogation in my past. Oh, really? And, uh, that's the thing is I, uh, I don't want to treat it as an interview or an interrogation. I kind of want to just leave it open ended, like ask you about your background, kind of flush out the conversation. But you must inherently just bring in some of those skills. I do, but I, <laughs> which ones? Uh, it's just the, the rapport building. You know, you always have to start out. Um, What's that? Waterboarding? No. no sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the rapport building. It's funny because when I got back from the war, I actually went to work for a, for a DOD for a bit, working the uh, Guantanamo Bay investigation. This is, was post waterboarding. And that's everything. Everybody that knows I did that was always like, did you know how, do you know how to waterboard? I'm like, no, I don't. Yeah. Could you, could you waterboard me just to see what it's like? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, where can we find you? Well, I have a website, markvalley.com. It's under construction right now, but I'm on Twitter at YesMarkValley. Um, Instagram, YesMarkValley. No, Instagram, just MarkValley. And go to markvalley.com. It'll show you everything. And I have a, yeah, my podcast is called The Live Drop. It's on iTunes. Actually, why don't you talk about that podcast real quick? Because I mean, I, I really, I have not listened to it yet. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to you first and kind of get an idea of what it's about. And I'm sure the audience would love that too. Sure. Yeah. I, I started writing a pilot. I was stationed in Berlin around the time of the wall came down and Berlin was, you know, it's the spy capital. There were 31 different intelligence agencies operating for, from various flags at, at the time. And uh, I remember just taking it for granted. It was a little bit boring. It was like, Oh God, this cold war stuff. Will you stop asking me the questions stranger, you know, but then I became a little more interested in it. Afterwards, I was writing a pilot about this special operations guy who goes back to Berlin to answer to his, you know, his past and he just is a Stasi nemesis. And I was doing a lot of research and was talking to people from that uh, community there. And I thought, well, there's some, one, there's some very interesting people. And I had some interesting conversations, but also what was interesting is they were, they were difficult. I'd never been an interrogator or, or anything like that, but I thought these are very challenging conversations because there's not really a lot 
people can talk about um, as far as like practical things, what, what they were doing, sources and methods and all that stuff. So I thought, oh, this could be, this would be a kind of a cool podcast. So I kept that in mind. And then about a year ago, I started, uh, you know, starting with some of those people that I initially talked to. I, um, yeah, put a podcast together. I actually, I started as a, a co-host with Pete Turner, who's probably someone you want to have on your show. He's a, he's a veteran, uh, really skilled guy in the podcast world. He's kind of helped me figure out the technology, some of the techniques of interviewing. And um, yeah, he really kind of gave me my start. I co-hosted on his show, The Break It Down Show. So and I started my own. Pete's yeah. been helping me out <laughs> with my, uh, I'm trying to get the audio down for this. Uh, I've had such tough issues in the beginning, but Pete's really helping me out. So I definitely have to have him on the show as well. Yeah. Have Pete. You talk to Pete too. I'm like, Oh, well, how do I do this? Let me call Pete. I know he's awesome. Cause I got one of those zoom H sixes and I'm like, Oh, how do you use this thing? <laughs> it's like Pete, Hey, can I talk to you? Listen, just a minute. I'm, I'm talking with this Filipino chef. Who's like front man for like a rock band in Indonesia. <laughs> Like, okay. Okay. Well, call me after. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, thanks a lot for coming on, Mark. I'm going to have you on again soon. I want to get some more uh, questions prepared for you that have kind of sure, really wanted to learn more about uh, your, like, you know, just your different aspects of your podcasting, just different points of view. So that'd be great. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to hear about your experience in the military as well. I'm always fascinated with guys who are, um, you know, interrogating and using, using you know human intelligence to get information it's, it's yeah definitely cool thanks, thanks a lot mark all right bye